In this episode of the Ben Greenfield Fitness Show, becoming a super ager, the internet of food, how to get lots of stuff done every day, the best intervals to build VO2 max, is hydrogen peroxide therapy safe, top five anti-aging tips, and much more. He's an expert in human performance and nutrition. Voted America's top personal trainer and one of the globe's most influential people in health and fitness. His show provides you with everything you need to optimize physical and mental performance. He is Ben Greenfield. Power. Speed. Mobility. Balance. Whatever it is for you that's the natural movement. Get out there. When you look at all the studies done, studies that have shown the greatest efficacy all the information you need in one place, right here, right now, on the Ben Greenfield Fitness Podcast. Rachel, does my voice sound funny? Uh, it doesn't. Why? Should it? I guess my voice probably always sounds, sounds a, little a little funny. Funny, I know it's just funny. Uh, I I think my voice sounds funny. I often hate to hear myself talk, but but this morning especially, I shouldn't say I hate to to to, to hear myself talk. I just yeah. You, you ever run into that? Like, I all the time. It's super cringy sometimes when I when I play back these podcasts. Yeah. I'm like, oh god. Especially when I was a kid, I, I used to hate to hear my own voice. But but no, this morning. I'm wearing an extremely, extremely tight belt oh. uh, that's that's uh, is, decompressing my spinal disc. It, 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 it's called a, uh, did I say my spinal disc? <laughs> I meant to say my spinal discs. Uh, it's a decompression belt. Have you heard, heard of this before? No. It's a Dr. Hose. Dr. Hose. Decompression belt. Like three years ago, we talked about it on the podcast, somebody actually called in a question. They're like, have you ever heard of Dr. Hose decompression belt? And of course, right away, I thought of some like, you know, some Asian dude in like a white white lab coat selling snake oil on the internet. Mm -hmm. uh, but I looked into it and then I eventually bought one when I injured my low back and I threw out my low back. I think I talked about this on last week's podcast a couple of weeks ago doing some gymnastics training. And so I got this decompression belt because it, it takes, it tractions your spine. So anytime you traction the spine, what that means is you're gently stretching the area between the joints so that they would then rehydrate. Mm -hmm. And it's this belt, and it's got like a little pump, and you pump it up. And you pump it up I'm wearing tighter? It right now. Is that what the pump's and it for? It works. It's, it's not like a weightlifting belt. It actually, when you, as you pump it up, it expands like vertical, vertically, mm -hmm. like up and down. So it, so it spreads apart the vertebra and the space between the vertebra and your back, and it helps a ton. So that's what I'm wearing right now, in case my voice and you. Funny. <laughs> Your voice, it doesn't sound that funny. But are you finding any, are you feeling anything different when you have it on? Uh, Yeah, like zero pain, zero pressure. Wow. And, and Aww, my, my back's cool. like at like 95% anyways, it's almost healed up. But anyways, I'm wearing my belt. How was your weekend? There you go. Weekend was awesome, Ben. I actually saw you over the weekend. We went to Jackson okay. Hole for an event. Yeah. And um, lots of fun, lots of skiing, lots of uh, mushroom taking, which was <laughs> kind of funny, but... <laughs> You know what? It, it was, was a nature a, experience. It uh, was, yes. Psilocybin in addition to uh, enhancing neurogenesis and neuroplasticity, which of course is why everybody takes it, just to build new right. brain cells. We all know that. Um, yeah, it, it it can make skiing more fun. <laughs> <laughs> I, I think I, I think one of the texts that I received from you over the weekend was uh, you looking for your husband because he and I were wandering around the Four Seasons Spa uh, relatively high on shrooms, so it was a it was an interesting, <laughs> interesting weekend. What uh, happens when when Rachel and Ben get together with our with our respective with our partners? Spouses? Yeah, yes. but anyways, it was a it was a good time. Hopefully, you've recovered. I have recovered. News flashes. News flashes. I think we should get rid of the guy's voice, and I should just sing it. Yes, go on. Do yeah. it. I love your voice. You have a great singing voice. I've been hearing um, more of it lately, and I hear you're going to go to an open mic night. 
if you go to Instagram.com slash Ben Greenfield Fitness, you can you can see my new uh, music instructor, Mike Myers, not to be confused with the Canadian comedian. And for, it would be pretty cool, though, to get taught music by Mike Myers. It would be. Get his Scottish, his Scottish voice. Lots of fun like stuff a, happening. Like, on like an orange on a toothpick. Come go. on, baby back, baby back, baby back, baby back. Babes. It's not a podcast unless we get some fun mini accent me. from you. Mini me. <laughs> he could do the mini me too. Uh, We're no, so I'm, serious, I'm, uh, aren't we? I'm taking uke and guitar lessons and I'm a huge fan of hiring an instructor anytime that you want to keep yourself accountable yeah. uh, compared to, say, just going to internet YouTube videos to learn something. When you, when, so now I have a gymnastics instructor that who's should keeping be me. me accountable. I have a music instructor who's keeping me accountable. And I have a tennis instructor. That was one of my goals for 2017 was to invest in myself, even though I'm a complete cheap steak, cheap, cheap, cheap steak. <laughs> so I'm wearing I'm wearing a a, a spinal <laughs> compression belt and I'm a cheap steak. I need to learn how to talk. This you time. are killing it. I know. Anyways, though, so uh, it, you know I'm a cheapskate and I I kind of cringe thinking that oh I don't need an instructor I can learn this stuff for free myself. But once you hire an instructor, your motivation to learn goes through the roof. Mm -hmm. And of course, that can be said for for music, for sports, for exercise, anything. And so I'm kind of kind of uh, hitting it on all three spectrums. You want to know so what my three are? For this year, go for it. Spanish, which mm. you have a very interesting news flash about, not Spanish Sweet. in particular, but learning languages, writing, and art, charcoal drawing. Mm. Nice. Yep. Nice. You could do all three. You could write a Spanish painting. <laughs> That's, uh, we just biohacked my whole 2017. Shall we jump into, yes, we speaking of biohacking, our first newsflash, HRV. Of course, we get many questions about HRV, also known as heart rate variability. And there was a great article uh, that we'll link to, as we link to everything, over at bengreenfieldfitness.com slash 364 on how to use heart rate variability training more intelligently. Uh, this was in, in Outside Magazine, and one of the things, or, or, or several of the things that it goes into, are some really good, I think, practical tips for HRV. Um, and, and the first is to, this is, this is written by Alan Cousins, who's, who's a pretty, pretty smart little cookie when it comes to exercise physiology. Uh, the first is to build a baseline. What that means is that your baseline measurement might be different than, say, mine or somebody else who's tweeting or Facebooking their HRV out there on the internet. So if the, if the, the average data for one person is, say, 90, and that's their baseline, your baseline might be 85 or 80. But it's really important to get a baseline measurement and to spend some time when you first start tracking your HRV which in my opinion is the best way to keep track of your nervous system and to predict illness or injury, you'll start to see patterns eventually. But what's really important is to always capture the data in a similar context. He mm -hmm. goes into this in the article. How, how for, for example, for me, I rarely take my HRV other than lying in bed five minutes first thing in the morning. So that's really important. You, you build a baseline and you take it at the same time yeah. when you take it. So you're just eliminating um, all of the variables. Exactly. Exactly. Another another really important one that he goes into is that there are some very good athletes who tend to have low heart rate variability. Mm -hmm. And in some cases, that can be because they specialize in their specific sport. Let's say you have uh, a football player who just trains purely for power and strength and actually has very poor aerobic capacity or poor parasympathetic nervous system balance. Well, technically, their HRV would be low. The same could be said for, you know, a marathoner, you know, who specializes in aerobic and has, has poor power, poor strength, poor speed, poor sympathetic nervous system tone. But that's because they've chosen to, to, to have their nervous systems excel in something that dictates that their heart rate variability might be low because mm -hmm. they're kind of like putting all their eggs in one basket, so to speak. Right. So that's another kind of important thing to realize is, is that depending on what you've chosen to specialize in, your HRV might be a little bit lower. So um, comparing yourself to others is pretty um, irrelevant. Right, right. Uh, another important point that he goes into was to use your number to plan your workouts. So uh, th this is this is should go without saying and is relatively intuitive, but you need to be able to adapt to what your HRV is telling you on the fly. So what I mean by that is there are some days where I will wake up in the morning 
And although typically my HRV is like 90 to 95, I've woken up some days and it's like 75 or 80. And sometimes I feel pretty good, but the HRV is low. And I guarantee that if I train through a low HRV within two to three days, my throat starts to get scratchy. Uh, a certain joint starts to feel a little bit tweaky, right? For me, it's typically like like shoulder, low back, or ankle, right? Like those are kind of like my three weak links. And it's because I ignore what my nervous system is telling me because a lot of times nervous system warning signs precede musculoskeletal or immune system warning signs. Mm. And so don't just take your HRV and then ignore it. Take your HRV and then know how to adjust your training on the fly. Have those workouts you can pull out of your pocket where you can say, okay, HRV is low today rather than hitting the CrossFit wad or going out and doing what my coach has told me or doing what I've planned for the day for a hard workout. I'm instead going to do yoga or sauna or an easy walk in the sunshine or something like that. And at this point for you, are there any, any, ever any anomaly numbers? So do you ever get like a low score where it's actually not true and you probably could train the next day or is it a hundred percent all the time? Yeah, because sometimes it can be suppressed when you've changed up your nightly routine the night before. Uh, wow. And in many cases that has to do with uh, uh, stimulants or drugs or supplements that you may have taken. You know, mm-hmm. one notorious one that will lower heart rate variability drastically would be an antihistamine, right? Let's say you're really stuffed up and you couldn't sleep and so you desperately grab some NyQuil or something like that. Well, that's going to suppress your heart rate variability. And it's not going to suppress it because you're overtrained, you're about to get sick or injured. It's because that's just what an antihistamine does to your HRV. So there are some situations like that, but usually you'll know, right? Yeah. Like you drastically change something up the night before. Right. So All right. You know, you Good. copious amounts of, of mushrooms <laughs> or something like that, um, which by the way, actually jacks up uh, HRV. I've found, um, psilocybin is really interesting in that sense. I, I don't want to give people, by the way, especially those driving in their minivans with their children, the idea that we endorse the uh, frequent use of, of mind bending drugs. Uh, but at the same time, plant based medicine is very interesting. It is play around with. Okay. So, uh, the next thing that I wanted to get into was this really interesting article on the internet of food. Did you, did you, uh, see this one? Fascinating article. It is quite fascinating. Uh, what, what this article goes into, and it was on fast company magazine was DNA testing and how we can now use DNA testing in our quest for a perfect diet. And it goes into several companies that are doing some really cool things. For example, there's a company called Vitagene, and they use DNA to discover nutritional deficiencies, and then they create like a personalized vitamin and mineral supplementation program based on your specific vitamin and mineral deficiencies, which I think is is really cool. I think it would be uh, even better if they use like blood and biomarker testing in addition to DNA testing. Uh, but there are other companies like uh, a Viome I was looking into the other day. They they look at your unique biology, your DNA, your microbiome, and then they use artificial intelligence to to prescribe you, say, supplements or or dietary changes or lifestyle changes based on that. Um, there's there's another one uh, called Habit, and Habit is this company that has tests, the DNA and blood tests that they send to your house. And then you send those back and they send back like personalized nutrition advice. And then yeah. I've, I've interviewed the folks at, at DNA fit in the past about this. And it, it actually is really interesting. And later on, when we talk about like enhancing your ability to, to have like a really good anti-aging protocol, I actually want to talk a little bit about how you can use this kind of data to, to uh, age more gracefully. Yeah. Uh, but, but the article itself has some, has some really interesting information too on gadgets. Like there's this company called NIMA, N-I-M-A, and they have this new portable device that tests food for gluten. I can just imagine All a whole the, bunch of people. Yeah. <laughs> Walking into restaurants with their NEMA, testing whether or not their their salad does have traces of gluten on it, and then freaking out. Yes, exactly. Getting all, all litigious because there's a there's a particle of gluten, of gluten on their, in their food. Yeah, from from a stray crouton. <laughs> uh, there, there's another company called Telspec, T E L L S P E C, that has this new gadget that will estimate calories, carbs, fats, protein, fiber, and glycemic load of any type of food. Which yeah. is kind of cool. I mean, that you don't you don't necessarily have to have a nutrition label. You could just do that on, say, an apple or a piece of steak. Mm-hmm. 
Um, there's another one called MyDX, which stands for My Diagnostic, and it's like this little plug-in module that tests your food for pesticides and heavy metals, and it can also test things like uh, like water. It can even test cannabis to see if, if it has pesticides or heavy metals in it, which is actually kind of uh, kind of a, an interesting point because I've found that more and more when I look over the blood and biomarkers of people, if they're doing like heavy metal tests and toxin tests, they test really really high in cadmium, which you notoriously find in, in marijuana because a lot more people these days are, are using that as you know as as plant based medicine because right. it's 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 uh it's it's growing in terms of its uh its legality but it is also really high in cadmium and so it's really interesting this article as far as like all these different like patented algorithms these companies are developed that developing that allow us to use a combination of food sensors and technology to to play around with the internet of food and so I have a question about this because we get a lot of questions on customizing people's diets and what people should eat. And is it kind of, do you uh, suggest that the first layer of customizing your diet is to get your DNA tested? I think that that is crucial. I, I think DNA. So, so what I do with my clients, like if somebody hires me for coaching, we do four things. We do DNA, we do blood testing Right, for things like thyroid and uh, you know, lipid panel, red blood cells, white blood cells, things like that. We do urine to look at hormones, right, like testosterone, cortisol, melatonin, et cetera, because a blood test is only a snapshot. It doesn't give you like, like a running tally of what goes on all day, whereas you, you know, peeing on a strip five times a day gives you that running tally. And then the last one would be the, the poop test, the infamous poop in a hot dog tray for three days in a row and then send it off with the prepaid FedEx label uh, to tell you yeast, bacteria, fungus, enzyme production, et cetera. Those four tests can allow me when I get all those back into my email inbox or that, you know, my, my client will send me like their login for 23andMe or their login for direct labs or wherever else they're getting these tests done or, you know, wellness FX. Then I can look over all those and say, hey, your vitamin D is just fine. You don't need to be on some vitamin D supplement or you've got really low red blood cell magnesium, so we should get you on like a, a magnesium citrate before you get to bed at night. Mm -hmm. Or you have uh, you you have the genetic marker responsible for causing familial hypercholesteremia, meaning that you would do better on a higher fiber, higher carbohydrate, lower fat diet because you are you're a cholesterol storer. So, yeah, it, it's also yeah. why I've never written or haven't yet written a diet book. Right. Because I would only ever write a diet book that uh, prescribes a diet that allows somebody to plug in all these different parameters and then tweak their diet mm -hmm. according to their genetics and their blood and their biomarkers. And I'm sure I could probably figure out how to how to write a book about that. But for now, I don't know. What would I call it, Rachel, if I did a did a diet book? I don't know, Ben. You're the genius here. <laughs> <laughs> mm, yeah, the perfect diet. That's the title of the article, the quest for the perfect diet. So there you go. Uh, we'll, we'll link to that one in the show notes as well. And speaking of diet, really great article on calories and metabolism and fat loss that came out a few weeks ago by a former podcast guest and a friend of mine, uh, Ray Cronice. Uh, Ray's the guy made famous in Tim Ferriss's uh, Four Hour Body. I think it was. He's like the cold thermogenesis guy, the guy who has hacked his body using things like cold showers and shiver walks. And he was doing all this stuff before you know Wim Hof arrived on the scene. It's not quite as sexy as Wim Hof. He doesn't have a Polish accent or the beard. He's just all the stark, beautiful blue eyes. He's just a shaved, bespectacled, bes bespectacled, bespectacled man. Um, anyways, a cool guy. And the article is fascinating. Uh, a few of the, of the, of the quick takeaways that he goes into is, uh, first of all, he talks about oxidative priority of foods, meaning certain foods are burnt before other foods and the, and the priority in which foods are burnt. Let's, let's say you're, you're having these things as a meal is first alcohol, alcohol gets burnt before anything else. Uh, then protein gets burnt next and then carbohydrates and then fat. And each of these foods has a different oxidative potential in terms of the amount of calories that are going to be used when burning that food. Mm -hmm. And he goes into how we can we can tweak our diets and tweak our, our ability to lose weight based on adjusting the amount of each of these foods that we're eating. And then based on that, he's developed this thing called a, a food triangle. 
in which he has foods with the lowest amount of what's called energy density and like the, the base of the triangle. And these would be things like leafy greens and cruciferous vegetables and stems and bulbs and mushrooms. And this is like the bulk of the dietary recommendations in the article. And then we also have, uh, you know, kind of, kind of in terms of increasing energy density on one side, you know, fruits, legumes, cereals, starchy vegetables, et cetera. And then on the other side, fats and proteins like meat, eggs, dairy, poultry, fish, and shellfish. And uh, the, the article itself goes into how weight loss or the ability to lose weight is really based on the effects of these different types of foods and combinations of these different types of foods to shift what's called our respiratory quotient which would be like like how many calories we're actually burning when we're just sitting around and doing nothing at all. And also the oxidative priority, like, like how quickly a food is actually oxidized in the human body. So when we look at oxidative priority, right, like, it, like if we were to say like eat a, you know, eat a, eat a high animal fat based meal with a couple of glasses of wine and some cereal, we get a whole bunch of energy density and it would also have a high oxidative priority, and it would also uh, result in a uh, in a in a slightly lower RQ. Whereas if we're engaging in things like intermittent fasting, foods with high nutrient density and low energy density, we're all of a sudden equipping ourselves to have a high RQ and lower cal- caloric intake. And mm. it's um it, it, you know the article is a little bit dense to get through, mm-hmm. but it's it's really really good uh, in in terms of of kind of understanding why basically a calorie is not a calorie. Right. And is there any fundamental takeaways for people who just want like snapshots of the easiest way to lose weight? Uh, eat more vegetables and do more intermittent fasting. That's go. really like, that's really like the, the big, big takeaway. Oh, and if you're going to drink alcohol, try not to consume alcohol along with other foods because those other foods are going to get stored away as fat far more easily when accompanied by something that has a very high oxidative priority, which would be alcohol. Right. And that's why I always have my nightly glass of elderberry wine on a completely empty stomach, usually after a workout. There you go. Plus, it makes me makes me a much more fun guy to be around. <laughs> it spins the dials in my brain that much more easily because I'm in a in a unfed state. So there you have it. Turn yourself into a cheap date. Um, okay. Another article that I thought was really interesting was uh, something that was reported on, I think, Radio Lab did a story on this is this idea behind a flickering light, a new flickering light that could help to treat Alzheimer's disease. And and what they found, and this was admittedly in a mouse model, but still really interesting at MIT, they found that flashing light at a specific frequency. And in this case, it was, it was a pulse at about 40 Hertz. They were able to use these flashes of light to tune what are called gamma oscillations in mouse brains. Uh, and and what that means is uh, they kicked the microglial cells in mouse brains into action, caused more neural activity. And it, when you, when you look at people with Alzheimer's, these these gamma oscillations don't occur at their regular rate. What they were able to do was basically reboot the activity of these microglial cells in mouse models and actually reinitiate the production of these these gamma oscillations resulting in an increase of alpha brain waves and, and and all they did it with was a flashing light that they exposed these mouse brains to so is the just a standard flashing light or a standard flashing light directly into the eye uh what they used was a flickering light i don't know if they used the eye or if they actually had like the top of the mouse i like to imagine they had the top of the mouse head kind of like cut off you know and the brain was there and <laughs> Because I like to, to I don't like to imagine that, that complex sounds... scientific scenarios. Uh huh. Yeah. I know. I'm I'm not vegan. I can imagine mice's heads. Whereas, Being off. yes, you're banned from doing that because you only eat veg. No, I know you're eating fish now. I am. But I hope you're not eating mice. I'm not uh, eating mice. Either way, I find this most interesting because I had some people on the podcast uh, last year, the folks from from Violet, and I actually wound up spending fifteen hundred bucks after I talked with them on, on this thing called a Violet Noro. Because it does something almost identical to what they just found in this this, this mice. It's it's a near infrared headset, 
and it uses something called photobiomodulation to stimulate the production of alpha brain waves and to stimulate the activation of mitochondria and neural tissue. And in this case, it's light energy. You stick this little probe up your nose, and then the headset goes in your head. And I'll link to this in the show notes. People want to see what it looks like. But 10 hertz is consistent with an, with what's called an alpha wave oscillation rate. So granted, it's a little bit different than the, than the gamma oscillations and the 40 hertz that they use in this study. In, in this case, the, the violet is a alpha oscillation and 10 hertz. But it's the same type of concept. We can actually change our brain and increase the activation of neural cells with the use of light. And they've actually found that this can treat Alzheimer's disease, which isn't why I use it. I use it as as a neural hack to actually improve alpha brainwave production, intelligence, working memory, you know, all, all the other things that photobiomodulation can do. Uh, and also nitric oxide. You get this huge release of nitric oxide in neural tissue and that crosses your blood brain barrier and can actually act almost like Viagra for the rest of your body in terms of opening up blood vessels and things along those lines. And but it's does, a it's, it's a violet- really interesting concept. There's this concept of using flickering light to right. change your brain. That was gonna be my question. So the violet does flick. It's not it is a flickering light. Yeah, when you put it on your head it looks like police sirens kind of <laughs> like red police sirens or red yeah. light special. Go ahead. What were you gonna say, Rachel? I was gonna say you're always so ahead of the curve, Ben. That's right. Always ahead of the curve with those those heat gated ion channels in my brain and strange looking things on your head. That's right. Uh, so the the last thing that I want to mention is this article about how to become a super ager. Uh, I always, you know, my my, uh, my how's the saying go? My ears perk up, my yeah. eyes perk up whenever yeah. whenever I see an article about super like aging and anti aging. Mm-hmm. Because it's something I'm, I'm keenly interested in, not because I'm grasping at straws and trying to squeeze as many years out of my life as possible, although I, I kind of am. But I, I just <laughs> I, I really I really like this concept of enhancing the human body and brain to the extent to where you can put as many quality years on your life as yes. possible. Right. I don't think that you necessarily want to be like hunched over in a wheelchair at 160, cold, shivering and starved because you're engaging in in fasting and, uh, you know, a sedentary lifestyle and unable to move. But like if I can be strong and vibrant and lively dancing when I'm 150, great. So, uh, this particular article uh, goes into the idea that they used functional magnetic resonance imaging or MRIs to scan the brains of 17 different people who they called super agers. And these are basically like old people who are really smart and really active and just kicking butt in life. And they identified these brain regions uh, in what's called the lateral prefrontal cortex. And what they found was a great deal of activity in those brain regions. And uh, in in short, even though the article is relatively long, what they found was that if you can somehow stimulate those particular regions of the limbic system, which are the major hubs for communication through your brain, then you basically become very much like one of these superagers, or your brain becomes very much like one of these superagers. Well, one of the best ways to actually stimulate these particular areas of the brain is through either A, vigorous exercise, or B, bouts of strenuous mental effort. And if you can combine the two, all the better. Meaning if Hmm. you can find activities that would, for example, challenge your brain and your body at the same time, that's one of the keys. So like this afternoon, I have a tennis lesson. I've been taking a tennis lesson every Wednesday afternoon. And this guy, Jeff, at the tennis club, he runs me around. I'm huffing. I'm puffing. I'm trying to remember what he told me about my forehand grip and my backhand stance. While at the same time, my heart's beating through the roof because he's feeding a ball to the right, then feeding a ball to the left, then bringing me to the net, then giving me an overhead and bringing me back away through the net, then back to the baseline for the forehand, to the backhand, to the approach shot. When I'm going through a situation like that, that is stimulating the hell out of my prefrontal cortex. And achieving many of these same type of uh, of stimuli that they talk about in this article. You know, the same could be said for like a, a Spartan race, right? Where you're under barbed wire, over a wall, climbing the, 
the the uh, the the cargo net, you know, swinging across the monkey bars while at the same time, you know, you're huffing and puffing, strenuous exercise combined with mental effort, right? Ping pong, ping pong players have been studied and they've shown that they're some of the smartest athletes on the face of the planet. Again, because they're they're moving, they're active. It's actually a, a quite strenuous sport at the higher levels, but there's also a great deal of mental chess involved. So in, that's how you become a super ager. Well, in the article, they say do it till it hurts, and then a little more. And they mm-hmm. talk about like learning languages and math. And I'm curious how intellectually in- co- comparable it is to do a math problem until your brain hurts versus run a Spartan race. Well. First of all, what they say is that you must expend, the way they they say in the article is you must expend enough effort that you feel some yuck. They say, do it till it hurts (laughs) and then a bit more. Now, now what was your question? Because when I think about running a Spartan versus doing a math problem, how my brain feels is very different. Not that I run Spartans, you guys. <laughs> right. The, the key is to do both. Like like in the yeah. Spartan races, they used to, and, and I was kind of kind of bummed when they quit doing this. They used to have memory challenges. Oh right? wow! You, you'd pass you'd pass by a wall that would have you you'd like line up your race number, the last two digits of your race number, with uh, the those two digits that showed on the wall, and then there'd be a saying on the wall like like uh, one three dog six seven eight nine, and that would be at mile two. And at mile 10, you'd run by a guy with a clipboard and you would have to recite that exact phrase back to that person or your penalty was 30 burpees, right? Which is going to cost you like two, two and a half minutes in the race. So it's it's really interesting how when you combine the mental and the physical exertion, you almost get a double whammy effect when it comes to becoming a super ager. So basically, Rachel, what you need to start doing is... Your, your Spanish and your riding while you're on like a recumbent bicycle or an elliptical trainer. Doing high intensity notepad. interval training. Yep, exactly. <laughs> That's how you do it, baby. Special announcements. So, Rachel, remember how I went down to Florida and got shocked? Oh, Yes. Yeah, that that whole like sound wave, high frequency acoustic wave to yep. open up all the blood vessels in my genitals. Mm-hmm. Um, I wrote a whole article on this over at bengreenfieldfitness.com, how I came back with like increased vascularity. I think that night that I had it done, I I not not that the purpose of the protocol is to wake up multiple times during the night with bones, but, <laughs> but I that happens. woke up like eight times during that, you know, and then that that that, you know, I either I got used to it. Or, um, yeah, or the the boner frequency slightly diminished to the point where it was a, it was a sane number of bone. I'm just gonna see how many times I can say the word in out. One episode. I don't, I don't know if that marks a podcast as explicit. <laughs> as explicit, I think to, it really does. We need to bleep this out. But anyway, so this this is it's called the Gaines wave, and it was uh, invented by this guy named Doctor Gaines. Who I actually he was on the podcast and i went down to florida and and had this protocol done literally like you know waltzed into his uh office and went through this you know series of, of medical examinations and then this uh nurse whisked me off into a room where they they do this protocol on both males and females to enhance things like vascularity and size and feel and sexual performance and, and orgasm strength and it's this painless high frequency acoustic wave that opens up old blood vessels and stimulates the formation of new vessels and gets you all of these benefits without you having to take like Viagra or Cialis or, or any prescription or any pill. And the very cool thing is, you know, I'm now two months out and I'm still having these raging hard-ons. Uh, and basically that that's the idea behind it is the results last for, for months, not like, you know, two hours like right. they would if you took Viagra. And do what, do they, what do they say when you take Viagra? If it lasts more than five hours, it's a go to the hospital. <laughs> priapasm. You're supposed to go to the hospital. So, anyways, this, this type of shockwave therapy they've used it in Europe for over 15 years, and it's uh, it's uh, now cleared by the FDA, and you can do it uh, here in the here in the U.S. too. So uh, they're actually hooking everybody listening into this show up with a deal, 150 nice. bucks off of what they call the gains wave treatment so it's pretty easy you text the word greenfield there's my last name greenfield uh to 313131 so g-r-e-e-n-f-i-e-l-d to 313131 and that automatically gets you 150 bucks off the treatment 
And if you decide you want to go to the Florida facility where I went and had it done and go see Dr. Gaines himself, even though you can get this done anywhere in the U.S., uh, they'll also give you a big discount at the Florida clinic. You just need to tell them I sent you. Um, you can go to healthgains.com and uh, and get the number for the Florida clinic if you happen to want to go to Miami and get it done where I got it done. Very so, cool. And do they have clinics uh, like in every state? Yeah, on their website oh. you could you could go search. But a uh, really cool protocol. They do like O shots and P shots and all sorts of kind of cool things like platelet rich plasma injections in your genitals. It's uh, it's kind of a cool protocol. So check that out. Um, in addition, a few other things. I'm going to be speaking uh, actually kind of in your neck of the woods, Rachel. Mm-hmm. Vancouver, Washington, which is pretty close to Portland, Oregon, uh, March 3rd through the 5th at what's called the Nutritional Therapy Association Conference. Uh, so you can check it out at bengreenfieldfitness.com slash NTA. But the cool thing about these folks, the nutritional therapy folks, is they also uh, certify you as a nutritional therapy practitioner and they use a very, um, have you ever heard of the Weston A. Price diet, Rachel? Yes. Okay, yep. so this is this is based around the fact of using like real high quality nutrient dense ancestral foods to heal the body. So they're not talking about like whole wheat bread and energy drinks and power bars. Instead, they focus on really nutrient dense foods, really ancestral foods. And you learn how to use those, you know, things like fermenting and soaking and sprouting and things like that to help people lose weight or enhance performance or even heal disease. So uh, it's called the Nutritional Therapy Association. And uh, you, you can go to nutritionaltherapy.com to check them out and to, and to get into one of their classes. The registration closes very soon. I think it closes like February 6th, which is a few days after this podcast comes out. That's for the classes. You can get into the conference anytime at bengreedlefitness.com slash NTA. But it's pretty cool. Uh, the and are, nutritional are all therapy. the classes in person or can you do them online? Uh, you can do them online. Nice. Yep. You do not have to move to Vancouver. Even yeah. Though if you wanted to be close to Rachel, you could. For <laughs> we all could of you go people, for coffee. All you people who are Rachel stalkers. <laughs> um, also, this podcast is brought to you by ZipRecruiter. ZipRecruiter. Um, have you ever been in this website? No. It's pretty cool. So if you want to hire somebody, you go to ZipRecruiter.com. Or in this case, if you want to do it for free, you go to ZipRecruiter.com slash first. And you can take any job and you post it once. Then what they do is they go to like 200 plus websites and they repost your job to all those different websites like Facebook, Twitter, everywhere. But you just have one click on your end and automatically like all these qualified candidates start to roll into your dashboard, like your interface on ZipRecruiter. So you have no pain in the butt in terms of your email inbox getting blasted with all these random creepers who are trying to apply for your job or unqualified candidates or, you know, folks who are who are flipping burgers who really aren't qualified to say, I don't know, be a police officer or whatever the job post you're you're posting to ZipRecruiter. So uh, it's really cool, really slick. ZipRecruiter.com slash first is where you can go if you like own a business and you want to you want to hire somebody, it's well worth checking out. Pretty cool site. You can also go there to find a job if you want to as well. If you're just like sitting on your butt in your mom's basement, listening to this podcast, wishing you had a job, um, you can actually go to ZipRecruiter.com slash first. So check that one out too. Um, And then finally, this podcast is brought to you by Movement Watches, Mm -hmm. which my wife stole. My wife, yeah. did you see, did you see my wife's watch when we were in I didn't see Hall? it, but they're sexy watches. So I totally understand why she stole it. My wife was wearing my, it, it's the, the leather band one with the white face. And I don't know if you went to their website and looked at some no, of their I, other watches. No, I have, yeah. Um, they are beautiful, they beautiful are. watches on this side. I love my watch. My one that my wife stole. Uh, <laughs> the, the, by the way, the, uh, the model that I was wearing, uh, if I could find it here on their website, uh, I believe it was the Chrono, the Chrono, which is like the uh, it's a leather strap. It's the white face. So that watch costs one hundred and thirty five. It would normally cost five hundred dollars. Yeah. Uh, but at uh, Movement Watches, you also get fifteen percent off. So you can get you basically get that for under a hundred bucks. Um, free shipping, free returns. A really cool, high quality, minimalist looking watches. They look great. 
really they clean do. design. Um, you're going to get a lot of compliments on your wrist. So it's uh, here's the here's the URL: mvmtwatches.com/ben. mvmtwatches.com slash Ben, and that gets you a 15% discount on a very cool little timepiece. So I think that's that's about it for our, our special announcements, yeah? Yes, get All into right. the question. Here we go, question time. Listener Q&A. Hi, Ben. My name's Mark. Uh, I love your show and all that you do. Um, I'm a age group uh, competitive triathlete. And uh, about three and a half months ago, I got in a bike crash in a 70.3 race, broke my collarbone and six ribs, and pretty significantly um, collapsed my lung on the one side. Now in the last month or two, as I'm getting back into training and um, competing a little bit, I noticed a pretty dramatic uh, change in my VO2 max and um and my speed particularly on the run probably 15 to 20 percent probably five to ten percent in my swimming and my cycling and ben i'd love to know um just the the best way and the quickest way for me to get my competitive edge back um and get my vo2 max um, and my ventilatory capacity back up to where it was before thanks for all your help sounds like mark got a little beat up yeah, it sounds like a really bad fall. I'm sorry to hear that, Mark. Collarbone, ribs, collapsed lung. Mm. Must have been booking. Um, have you ever been a bi- in a bike crash? No, thankfully. Yeah, I've, I'm actually terrible at riding bikes, so I I've get made a ball. I've made a lot of of skin graft donations to the pavement in my Ugh. days because I I raced for a decade doing Ironman triathlon. My worst crash though was when I was like 11 years old. I got in a I got a concussion in a mountain bike accident. And I've had a few concussions since then. Remember when I went down to the to the peak uh, the peak brain institute in L.A. and they did like the QEEG on me, like the brain mapping yeah. on me. Yeah, yeah. There was a lot of damage that came up. Yeah, they can show like all these areas where you have TBI, and I don't I don't know if anybody. And I've got a repeat podcast coming up with them with all this neurofeedback training I've been doing. You know, flying the spaceships with my mind at home. I've actually because I went down there for a repeat mapping uh, two weeks ago. I have gotten rid of almost every single uh, fast beta brainwave area of my brain that was a result of some of those concussions and and traumatic brain injuries. So it's kind of cool. You can actually rewire and yeah. rewire your brain. Um, but Mark wants to rewire his lungs, get his VO2 max back. So yeah, it's kind of interesting because you'd think you could just go out and exercise hard and that would increase VO2 max. But it turns out that our our friends in science, uh, all those researchers in white lab coats making people puke on bikes, they've found that there are specific interval lengths that help with certain components of cardiovascular fitness. And VO2 max, it's, it's actually a specific uh, length of interval and a specific intensity of interval that's best for specifically increasing your maximum oxygen utilization. So that's helpful information to know. <laughs> well, that's what they call me, Mister Helpy Helperton. Um, there are a variety of different cardiovascular components you want to train. I have an article about this called "How to Look Good Naked," but I could have called it "How to Ride a Bike More Quickly," I suppose. Um, so, first of all, there's there's this thing called muscular muscular mus- muscle endurance, aerobic capacity. That, that's basically the amount of work your muscles can endure. The amount of time you can kind of like go to battle while keeping your force output really high. This would be like your tolerance to lactic acid, your tolerance to the burn. That's far different than your maximum oxygen utilization. That's more related to what we would call your lactate threshold. Well, a perfect example of how to build that would be a Tabata protocol. And in, in one of the more famous studies for increasing muscle endurance and tolerance to lactic acid four times a week for four weeks, folks were doing one single four minute Tabata protocol. Have you ever done a Tabata protocol, Rachel? I have. Yes. I do them twice a week on the bicycle. It's 20 seconds all out followed by 10 seconds of rest. That's it. So now that I'm doing gymnastics training protocols, I've been finishing up my gymnastics training protocol that I'm doing now twice a week 
with a Tabata set on the bike. So, and the 20 second efforts are all out. The 10 second efforts are, you know, you're, you go completely easy, but you can do these with kettlebell swings, cycling, rowing, whatever, but that's what you would do for muscle endurance. Okay. So, so increasing the amount of work that your muscles can endure. Those don't really increase VO2 max. They're not long enough to increase VO2 max, but you don't want to leave that type of training on the table. If you want to be a complete athlete, especially a complete endurance athlete. So that's kind of like one component are these, these Tabata sets. Okay. And yeah, I, I would recommend you do them at least twice a week, up to four times a week, as far as, as, as something very similar, like a 20 seconds on 10 seconds off for about four minutes. Now there's also this other component that is also really not VO2 max, but is another important component. That's mitochondrial density. So this would be, you know, mitochondrial, the power plants of your cells. And there's this concept called mitochondrial biogenesis, which is the creation of new mitochondria. And, and all mitochondrial density is, is that simply means that you have as many mitochondria packed into your muscles as possible. And that means you can utilize more fat and you can utilize more glucose to produce ATP. So to do this, so whereas the Tabata set is like these really hard efforts with pretty short recovery periods, right? So Tabata sets like a two to one work to rest ratio to increase mitochondrial density is kind of the opposite. It's 30 seconds or so of extremely hard efforts followed by complete recovery. So an example of that would be twice a week in the mornings. I get the eye crust out of my eyes, sip my cup of coffee and I head out to the garage. And what I do right now is a half hour on the treadmill. And it's four minutes of walking. So for me, it's uphill walking. And then every four minutes, I do a 30-second sprint as hard as I can go and then go back to walking for full recovery. And that's it. I I just do that for a half hour. That's a perfect example of how to increase your mitochondrial density. So the hard efforts are really, really hard, about 30 seconds long, but then you have complete recovery after each one. So again, it's a little bit different than the Tabata set where you're going and going and going and Frankly, each effort that you do, you're producing a little less power each time because you're getting that, you know, very short Mm. recovery period, whereas these mitochondrial density sprints are all out with full recovery. Right. So you'd want to include, you'd want to include mitochondrial density. You'd want to include muscle endurance type of training. Uh, And then the last thing before I get to VO2 max would be you'd want to optimize your fat burning efficiency. And this would be like those easy fasted fat burning workouts or these aerobic workouts that are a little bit longer in length, preferably with minimal fuel coming in and done at more of an easy conversational pace. So this would be like you get up on a Saturday or a Sunday morning and you do like, um, you know, an hour long bike ride on an empty stomach with, you know, a cadence of 90 at an aerobic heart rate where your muscles aren't burning. It's conversational but it's also enhancing your fat burning capacity because you haven't like dumped a bunch of glucose into your body beforehand. That's a perfect example of, of like a fat burning. And, th- and this is honestly the, the form of training that I think most people overdo because it doesn't, doesn't hurt like, like those other ones do. Um, and you can just kind of zone out and do it, you know, but, it, but it also is something that's necessary, especially if you're doing it in like a fasted state to increase your fat burning capacity. That would be kind of another piece of the puzzle to ensure that you have like a complete cardiovascular profile, right? Okay. Yep. Okay. So then we get to VO2 max and VO2 max in terms of the studies that they've done on VO2 max, uh, the minimum effective dose for this is about four minutes. Okay. So right around this four to six minute range is the sweet spot for VO2 max. And what you do is you go as hard as you can go for those four to six minutes. This would be your maximum sustainable pace that you can maintain with good form. Could be on the bike, running, swimming, whatever. And then you get full recovery after each one. So a perfect example of a VO2 max protocol would be five four-minute efforts with four minutes recovery between each one. So what does that come out to? That's like a, that's like a 40-minute workout right there, right? Like a, like a 40-minute VO2 max workout. And you only need to do that about once a week. So a lot of people overdo these kind of things. Like the muscle endurance, like the Tabata sets would be a couple of times a week. The mitochondrial sprints would be a couple of times a week. The fasted fat burning session, a couple of times a week. But then a VO2 max workout, you only need to do this once a week 
to build or to maintain your VO2 max. You could do it a little bit more frequently than that, but it's not necessary. And as a matter of fact, in the study that they've shown that that really shows that that this can this can help, uh, it was once every two weeks that they were doing this in soccer players to maintain VO2 max. If you want to build VO2 max, I'd recommend you do it closer to every week, but you can get away with this even once every two weeks if you just want to maintain. But again, it's four to six minute efforts, about a one to one work to rest ratio. And these efforts are done at an intensity to where you're not like completely looking like Bambi on ice by the end of the effort and just, you know, flailing. All over the place. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. So you, so you don't want your biomechanics to suffer, but it's hard enough to where you're, you're pushing pretty hard and it's taking a lot of focus for those full four to six minute efforts. And you do anywhere in the range of four to five of those. And that's it. And so are these all included in your how to look good naked? plan mm-hmm. yeah i even outlined them they're, they're all for free in that article i wrote if you want to go read the article I'll, I'll link to it in the show notes over at um ben slash 364 i don't recommend you ride your bicycle naked um <laughs> unless you have one of those cool seats with a little like hole in the bottom for your bike, which they actually I make yeah they make the, like, those split nose seats and I'm not the, surprised. And There's a, the naked bike ride that happens in them. Portland. Yeah. Mm. I swear by it. Like though, that's on all my bikes now. I, I forget. Who, I think it's Adamo. <laughs> they make the Adamo ISM seat, but it was designed to like reduce prostate inflammation and, and reduce the propensity for, for men to have erectile dysfunction after long bike rides. Yeah. I uh, did always wonder. Yeah. But we digress. We don't, we don't have to have every single topic get into it. I don't know how it it's happening. It just seems that we're straying that way on this, this episode. There you go, Mark. That's how you build your VO2 max. All right. There you go, Mark. Dude, this is killing me. I just got to your uh, weekly roundup, and uh, it's awesome. Um, but I've barely scrolled down, and um, this is the million-dollar or $10 million question. How do you get so much work done? <laughs> like so many projects, I just see interviews that you've done, which is fine. You're sort of on other people's time in a way. Uh, you still got a prep form, and then you've done uh, your own podcast. Uh, and then you've got articles, like a few articles, and then you're working on a, a, a chapter in your new book and all that sort of jazz and traveling. And how do you do it? That's my, uh, my $10 million question. I'd love to know, uh, what are your secrets? And I've read and I followed your, your stuff before. Um, I've hired you as well, but, uh, um, yeah, this just, just mind boggling. Uh, it's awesome. I just want to, uh, I just want to be able to mimic it in my life. So thank you very much. Uh, and I love all your stuff and uh, I refer to it all the time and I send people there all the time. Um, yeah, that's all. Thank you. Bye. Mm, it's because I take care of my body. You do. Um, it's, it's also actually, you know what my key to productivity is, is I'm a complete idiot when it comes to anything related to Hollywood. I go to the movie theater about once a year and I watch TV about once a month. Uh-huh. So that's like one of my keys to productivity. Yeah. Because I just really don't know what's going on in but, Hollywood. But you do read books. You read a lot of books. I read a ton of books. So I I saw uh, that Bert asked this question. And so I jotted down some notes about how yesterday went for me. I guess this would have been Monday. We're recording this on a Wednesday. But here's like a typical Monday for me. Because for me... It's all about habits. It's all about routine. So I set up every single day and I have a habit or a system for that specific day and it becomes automatic after a while. Once you have a routine, once you have a habit, it becomes automatic. And when that habit becomes automatic, then you get to the point where you can get a ton done in terms of, you know, Mark Mark asked about, you know, like interviews and podcasts and writing and, you know, I'm doing music, et cetera. So I'm going to walk you through what a typical day looks like for me. Okay. You ready? I am so ready. Okay. Here we go. So uh, Monday, I wake up at about 6 a.m. I roll over and I put on a, that heart rate variability monitor I was talking about. And I test my heart rate variability while I'm laying in bed. I also on this little aura ring that I wear that that lets me know like my my sleep cycles and stuff like that. I also take a glance at my at my aura sleep cycles. So that, so those are like the two little nerdy self quantification things I do each morning. But as both of those are downloading to my phone, I do my devotional and I do my gratitude journaling. So I'm getting all of that done before I get out of bed in the morning. I don't leap out of bed and check email or Facebook or Twitter or anything like that because that can suck you into like a 15 to 30 minute rabbit hole. I only check, I only check email 
two to three times per day. So I always batch email I'm, and all push notifications are turned off. So Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, all that zero push notifications. And furthermore, if I am going to go check email, I have one folder on the very top of my Gmail inbox that uh, is exclamation mark. So that 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 kind of lets you hack your email inbox on the folder and and ensure that any anybody who sends you an important email, you filter it so they go into the exclamation mark email inbox. So you don't have to filter through all the other unimportant emails to see the emails from important people. Yes. Like you, Rachel. I was going to ask, yes. but I thought I'm going to keep my mouth what? shut. I better you're be in, in that damn inbox. You're in the exclamation mark folder. <laughs> um even right. my wife, my wife isn't even in the exclamation mark folder. Well, that's because you work from home and yeah. she's home all day as well. Yeah. Plus she never sends me important emails. Right. It's always like clean the garage. <laughs> it's not important email. I don't need to see that. Um, anyways though, so I, I get all that done in bed and the phone stays off aside from the Bluetooth function getting turned on to the check. So I don't, I don't take the phone off of airplane mode. Right. Cause then it's going to blow up and there's going to be text messages and emails and all this other jazz. I don't want any of that. Right. So I just pulled the Bluetooth on do all the checking, and then I get out of bed and I head downstairs. And the very first thing I do right now, this is not something I used to do when I was younger, but I find that it helps now, is I have a foam roller sitting right there at the bottom of the stairs. I take out the foam roller and I do a quick foam rolling session just on, I mean, we're talking about like three to four minutes, right? And for me, it's on on any parts that I need to, that I need to hit that are just feeling stiff that day from the previous day's workout. And it's, it's just like my little habit, right? So, and honestly, it helps me kind of keep my body put together because if you do the math, it, that comes out to like, you know, over 40 minutes of foam rolling each week that I'm getting in if I'm getting those little bits done each day. I'm always mm-hmm. about the little things that add up. Um, and then these days, the thing I do right after I foam roll, because my, my fascia is all kind of like worked out after that, is I've been hanging upside down for about five minutes from the yoga swing. That's also hanging right there at the bottom of the stairs, right? So it's habits, it's system. The foam roller is right there in front of me. The yoga swing is right there in front of me. I can't walk past it in the morning without doing it. So I just do it all, right? And then I wander into the kitchen and I take my my morning supplements, right? So any supplements that need to be taken on an empty stomach. Let's say I'm going to take a Qualia Smart Drug that day. You know, I'd, I'd take step one because that's supposed to be on an empty stomach, Another thing that I'll take on an empty stomach would be like the lemon juice and water, right? For a little bit of alkalinity, but it's always a big glass of water and whatever morning supplements I have. The other thing I'm doing right now is I'm going through that whole like detox plan that we talked about several times on this podcast. Um, That's over at bengreenfieldfitness.com slash detox plan, ironically enough, (laughs) if you want to like dig into that one. But, but that includes like this little packet of pills I take each morning, right? It's all, it's like methylation support and blah, blah, blah. It's a, it's stuff that, that Dr. Uh, Dan Pompa has put me on for, for three months. So I, so I do that. Uh, and then, uh, I put the coffee on. So as the coffee and, and for me right now, it's just a French press, right? So that means I turn the boiling water on and as the water is boiling, I do my stretching, right? So I have this special series of stretches. Usually for me, it's either the gymnastic stretching that my new gymnastics coach is giving me, or it's these exercises from the core foundation book by Dr. Eric Goodman. So again, that's just five to 10 minutes of stretching, right? But, but it's just these little things. Cause again, that adds up to what, like, you know, over 60 minutes of stretching per week by me doing like that five to 10 minutes of stretching each morning while the coffee is on. Um, and then once the coffee is done, I grab it. Usually I dump a few mushrooms in there, not of the variety that we were doing this weekend, but uh, you know, four sigmatic sends me stuff like chaga and reishi and turkey tail. And I like to put some mushrooms in my coffee. Uh, they're really good for the immune system, really good for cancer fighting properties you know, all, all sorts of cool things mushrooms can do for you. So I dump those into my coffee, use about a teaspoon or so of mushrooms. And then I sit down on my computer and I put, and this is where I get a little biohacky. I put light in my ears and light in my eyes, right? So I put the human charger on my eyes and uh, or in my ears and I put the retimer glasses on my eyes and just blast myself with copious amounts of light which is a really really good circadian rhythm a jump starter while I do my one big hairy audacious task for the day <laughs> so like on on Monday that meant I had five emails that were it that I really had to respond sometimes it's an article I'm working on 
Sometimes it is uh, my my fiction book that I'm working on. If there's a chapter that's just like hanging over my head, but 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 if the way I approach it is like if I were to go to bed right now and it were the end of the day, what's the one thing I'd smile about having accomplished that day? And that's the one thing that I do as soon as I I turn. So again, I'm not opening Facebook, Twitter, or anything like that. I'm doing that one big hairy audacious task, and that's as I'm sipping my coffee. Right. Right. So usually I'm sipping my coffee for like 20 to 30 minutes working on that one big hairy audacious task. So once I finished that task and again, like on, on this lat on Monday, it was just five emails that were in that folder. I, I had expected them to be coming. It has to do with this whole rebranding I'm doing right now for, for our business. Uh, but I just got those out of the way, right? Cause I knew that I, my responses to those weren't going to be as good the rest of the day. Once all the you know, once, once all the other bullets started flying at me, then in the morning. So I do that. Yep. Okay. Then I go downstairs, I turn on the sauna and then I go upstairs and I go to the bathroom. So while I'm going to the bathroom, the sauna is heating up. And after I go to the bathroom, I go downstairs to the sauna. And this is almost every morning when I'm at home, 30 minutes in the sauna. And that's just with all my, all my stretching, my yoga, my deep breathing. Cause I find that when I do that, I'm de-stressed the rest of the day. It sets a, sets almost like a standard for the rest of the day. And then I go do my cold pool plunge. And what I've been doing now in the sauna is dry skin brushing, right? Which is really good for the, for the lymph system, really good for like self-love and body care. And so I, I do my dry skin brushing and feel fantastic when I do that. My skin feels fantastic too. Then my cold plunge, and then I go back into the house. Now by then, it's about 8, 830 Right. So the first two hours in the morning, I've gotten all my body care done and I've got my one big hairy audacious goal completely out of the way. And I've gotten my devotions and my gratitude journaling and all of the things that help me be me. They're done right by like 830 or so. Um, And then uh, what I've been doing when I go back in the house is I've been using my vibrator. (laughs) Yeah, my vibrator. Um, It's a (laughs) I'm guessing it's a foam rolling vibrator. No, no, it's, it's called a Mayo buddy. And ah. I've been, uh, basically, uh, using that. Don't laugh. It's this new thing I'm experimenting with, but I use it on my jaw. I use it all over the top of my head. And, and again, these are little things, but it takes like 60 seconds and it, and it brings a bunch of blood flow to my brain, kind of similar to when I'm hanging upside down, but I do that all over, all over my body. Um, and it just kind of like, it's, it, it, it's kind of like that dry skin brushing, but it's like that on steroids. And then I turn around after I've done that and I make my smoothie and, you know, my big morning smoothie, you know, right these days, it's, it's a little bit of the, the Pau Diarco anti-aging bark tea and a whole bunch of ice and usually like five or six different good fresh vegetables from the refrigerator and some nuts and a little bit of dark chocolate powder and a little bit of protein powder. And that's just all blended up and I blend it really thick. And along with that, I take any supplements that are best absorbed with food, right? Like my fish oil and my creatine and my multivitamin. And then I start work while I'm eating that smoothie because I like to eat the smoothie like with it with a spoon. And, you know, it takes me like a half hour to get through my whole smoothie. Mm -hmm. So from like, you know, 830 ish until 930 ish, kind of making breakfast, eating my smoothie. And then once I finished up that smoothie around like 930 or so, I go downstairs into my office and from 9 30 to 1 30 all push notifications turned off nothing distracted me i work like an animal for four hours i mean like an animal like like nothing i'm like a horse with blinders right i'm locked away in my office nothing bugs me there there are no social breaks there's no chatting on the phone there's just nothing every single goal that needs to be done for that day i'm getting done for the next four hours Uh, I do take mini breaks, right? So about every 30 to 50 minutes, I will stop and I'll do some stretching or I'll do some jumping jacks or I'll do some pull-ups. You know, here in my office, I've got kettlebells, I've got monkey bars to hang from, I've got a heavy bag to punch. So I'll I'll do little things here and there. I even have a little manual treadmill, right? And so in many cases, you know, I've I've got my, my, uh, it's a Jabra 930 headset. And then I use this piece of software called Dragon Dictation. And so a lot of times I can be walking on the treadmill, dictating emails, dictating articles, dictating whatever I'm working on for that day. And that's typically what I'm doing. Either walking on the treadmill dictating or else I'm, you know, podcasting or doing interviews or doing consults with my clients or you know, going over blood and biomarkers with people, whatever. But that's yeah. from 930 to 130. And, and again, 
full on no distractions, right? I don't I don't go out and have lunch with people. I don't do coffee with people. None of that, right? It's just hardcore. So those four hours are hyper productivity. And then I emerge from the office <laughs> bedraggled and just like completely, uh, honestly, I'm spent, right? Like I've been working my ass off. It's like yeah. after I finished a workout, right? So I come up and I'm finally ready for lunch. And lunch is almost the same thing every day because I'm not a big fan of decision-making fatigue. I grab some miracle noodles, which are almost like my version of pasta, and I fry those up in the the cast iron skillet with a whole bunch of vegetables and usually like some eggs or sardines, you know, some kind of good protein, some fats, like some nuts thrown on top. And then while I'm eating lunch, I go through the things that I've been ignoring the rest of the day that kind of sort of are work, but kind of sort of aren't. Facebook, Twitter, stuff like that, right? So uh, during lunch, again, I'm getting things done, but it's those little things that that I just, you know, I've been ignoring the rest of the morning. Um, after lunch, every day, I go upstairs. I've trained my body to just pass out and fall asleep for 20 to 40 minutes. So I lay out my biomat, I fall asleep. When I used to work in an office, I do the same thing, but I had this little spot underneath my desk and a sleeping bag, eye mask, and earplugs, and I would just go up under my desk and fall asleep. 20 to 40 minutes. That's it. Just, I just trained my body to do it. Um, so by that time, you know, considering that it takes me about an hour or so to have lunch, to take care of everything I'm taking care of during lunch and then get the nap in, I've got about an hour when I wake up from that nap to play catch up. I have identified that the afternoons are not my most productive time. That's not when I'm most creative, but I am able to take all those random tasks. So usually the afternoon is when I dive into email for about an hour and just do a huge batch of email. And I realize that I've got about an hour in there to catch up on all the emails and everything before my kids arrive home from school. And then when my kids get home from school, and this is at about 3.50 p.m., I have a good hour or so to just be with them, right? Legos, talking about their day, reading the books they got from the library, just quality time with the kids. Sometimes I'm leading them through a workout. Sometimes we're shooting the bow. Sometimes we're walking outside. Uh, and then eventually my kids leave because they always have some type of afternoon activity. Right? And sometimes uh, it's tennis, sometimes it's jujitsu, sometimes it's piano, whatever. So they leave. And so I have from about 4 to 6 p.m. when they're gone, four, well, 4.30 to 6 p.m. around there. Anyways, I, I, that's my time to do my workout, right? So in, in, the, in the late afternoon, early evening, I do my workout. And then I come in from my workout. And usually I've got a little bit of time before they get home from whatever it is they're doing, their, their after school activities. Um, and so it's during that time before dinner, when I'll do like ukulele, when I'll do guitar, when I'll sip that wine I was talking about and just kind of get, get some little like relaxing things done right before dinner. And then we always have dinner as a family. Usually we eat sometime around like 8 PM or so, uh, as a family. And again, I don't take a lot of snack breaks, nothing like that. So I've got my lunch at one I've got my dinner around eight. I've got my breakfast around like nine 30. And then, you know, and dinner is always like salad plus some kind of, you know, meat that Jessa makes like roasted chicken, you know, some sourdough bread, sweet potatoes, stuff like that. And we always play a game during dinner as a family. So it's like table topics game or cash flow for kids, which is a great game to teach them about money, or we'll do Pictionary, or we'll do like some kind of like Dungeons and Dragons kind of card game. But we always play a game together as a family during dinner because it's it's just like a fun we you know, we gather around dinner we take a long time to eat dinner right so we're usually at the dinner table to almost nine right like playing games and eating together how many hours and is that if you're there that? till nine how many hours is that if you're there till nine we usually what? start dinner about eight okay so, so yeah and that, and that that'll include like you know all the little things that we're doing you know it's talking about the day stuff like that and then the kids literally just like brush their teeth take their you know their vitamins and and go to bed right after that you know we go up in bed I usually will play them whatever song I had been working on the guitar that day. We do like our gratitude. We go around the room. Everybody says what they're grateful for. We pray. And then, you know, by that time, it, it really is about, you know, by, by 9, 9.15, like they're just like lights out, right? So we finish dinner. They're in bed. I then spend about a half hour getting any last things done for the day, dive into the email inbox one more time, make sure there's no little fires I have to put out even though I now have emails that go out to every member of my team telling them not to email me important things after 9 p.m. So I, so I know that when I dive into my email inbox at 9 p.m., like there's not going to be like some huge fire I have to put out. Mm -hmm. um, and then that's about 9.15, 9.30. 
And then I head upstairs and I read for 30 to 45 minutes and fall asleep. And that's it. All right. I have a bunch of questions, Ben. Three variables and then three principles that I picked up from that. So the three variables okay. are travel, sleep, and family. Does travel ruin this routine? How important is sleep for this? And how do you deal with things coming up with the family that are unplanned? So travel, I have my very similar routine. Get up, stretch, coffee. Like every, everything is almost the same when I travel, except of course there are little modifications when you're traveling. Like often instead of a smoothie, I'm mixing some meal replacement powder up in a cup, right? But same thing. You know, it's the same sequence of events. Wake up, HRV, devotions, journaling, you know, stretching while the coffee in the hotel room is on. So, so I try and maintain that same semblance when I'm traveling. Same thing when I go to bed, reading, et cetera. So um, are you packing just tons of stuff to take with you as well? So you always pre-plan your travel very thoroughly? Yes, but I only travel with a small backpack, the ukulele attached to the backpack, and my book bag, which nice. easily holds a Kindle, my computer, and a few of the little random biohacking things like the heart rate monitor and the, the glasses and the retimer. So I travel very light. Okay. Then I feel like we could do a whole other podcast on that. So then sleep. How important is sleep for this? What happens if you get a bad night's sleep? All that sort of stuff. If I get a bad night's sleep, sometimes the nap gets elongated. Okay. Right? So I always wake up at the same time. It's just a slightly longer nap if I have a bad night of sleep. Okay. And then family, what happens if things come up that are kind of out of this routine? Like what? Like if the kids get sick and they stay home, if, you know, Jessica can't take them to the afternoon, like, activity that they do. Uh, typically, when when a kid gets sick, they're just at home hanging out with me when I'm doing what I'd be doing anyways. Right. And when I need to take them somewhere, usually the, the something will fall out of the routine. It means that some emails will get shoved to the back burner and taken care of the next day. Or often I will substitute, let's say, a longer workout. You know, let, let's say I, I had an hour long workout planned. It turns into like, you know, two back to back to bata sets. So all of a sudden I've got 50 minutes freed up, right? So those are the type of things that will often get sacrificed if there's things that need to get done with the family. Interesting. And then, yeah. so a couple of little principles that really stood out to me. One was this concept of little things adding up every day. And I wondered how that applies, I mean, physically and mentally. I feel like to go from writing a 15-minute session on your fiction book to like doing a workout to doing like the next mental task, that constant chopping and changing of things has always felt really underproductive for me. But for you, it sounds like it's really productive. You only do one thing at a time ever. It's task switching that recruits way more, you know, drains more mental willpower and also decreases the effectiveness and the quality of a task. However, uh, task switching is different than multitasking, right? So I can switch from writing a fiction book to doing a workout to, you know, heading upstairs and, and making lunch, for example, and that I can do a high quality job at all of those. Whereas if I try to do all three at once, right? Like, you know, make lunch while I'm talking on the phone, while I'm glass eating meals, that's where you start to run into issues. Interesting. Now, if I could throw I'm in a so few, fascinated by this, yeah, <laughs> a few last things. First of all, I've written articles that detail in great detail my morning routine, my afternoon routine, and my evening routine, and I will link to all of those in the show notes over at bengreenfieldfitness.com slash three sixty four. I also just finished a little ebook, which is the most updated version of my entire routine. Uh, and that is called Daily Routines, A Practical Handbook to Optimize Your Body, Mind, and Spirit. It is seven bucks. It's a little ebook, and I will put a link to that in the show notes as well in case you just want to uh, have that on your Kindle or your phone or whatever, and you want to optimize your body, mind, or spirit. So check that out. Oh, and then finally, um, and Rachel knows this, I often will... Uh, will log my entire day on Snapchat. Literally, my phone's just out logging every little thing I do. And so that's over at bengreenfieldfitness.com slash Snapchat. If you just want to see a lot of this stuff live as it happens, if you're just a complete stalker like that. So there you have it. Hey, Ben and Rachel. My name is Tyson Brown, and I am 21 years old from Sydney, Australia. 
I'm currently a personal trainer and I love health and fitness. And my question for you guys is, how can I live to 120 years old? You probably don't hear this from a lot of 21-year-olds, but I know that I want to live past the 100-year-old mark and I want to do everything possible in order to do that. So is there anything you would recommend doing earlier in life that you wish you may have done to help you improve your longevity? Um, I love the podcast. I love all the knowledge you share. I love sharing it with my clients. And hopefully you guys can uh, put this question on the air. Thanks a lot, and I look forward to your answer. This is really interesting, like stuff that he wishes or stuff that he wonders if, if I wish I would have done early in life to yeah. improve my longevity. So um, first of all, well, l- let me start here. I've got a couple of really good anti-aging podcasts and articles. Like, for example, there's one called 11 Ways to Age Like a Badass. And in this one, I interviewed this guy named Mike Greer. And I first met Mike when I did a live event in Spokane, Washington. And uh, we were doing morning workouts. And it was called the Become Superhuman live event. And I had people come in from all over the globe to speak, you know, like that Ray Cronice guy I was talking about earlier. And I'm trying to remember who else was there. I think uh, Jack Cruz was speaking and Dave Asprey. And it was kind of cool. I, I think my cortisol levels went through the roof running a live event. I realized I'd rather go speak at events rather than actually put them on. Mm. Um, at least for now. Uh, but anyways, th- this guy wandered into one of the morning workouts that we were doing and just proceeded to destroy, you know, a handful of like fit young guys and girls who are doing like burpees and lunges and push ups and Turkish get ups. And <laughs> he had like his Iron Man shirt on and he was tanned and looked great. So I figured he was like some 50 year old triathlete, you know, workout enthusiast. And then I found out that he was 75 years old. And uh, he's a great grandparent, a retired lieutenant colonel, uh, a former football player, a seven-time Ironman triathlete. Uh, this guy is doing everything. He's the president and CEO of the Obstacle Racing Association. He's in the Texas Triathlon Hall of Fame. Uh, and so I interviewed him on a podcast. So first of all, go listen to that podcast because he talks about everything from how he really prioritizes, you know, like living an active sex life is like way high up on his list. Yeah. Um, he is totally opposed to this idea that stress shortens your life. He actually purposefully stresses himself kind of related to what we were talking about earlier about being a super ager because he realizes that all those hormetic stressors like keep you on the edge and actually make you live longer. Uh, and so you definitely should go check out the interview that I did with him, which I'll link to in the show notes. Uh, I also have this article called, uh, anti-aging secrets from five of the fittest old people that I know. And in that article, I go into a few concepts. First of all, how one of the uh, most important activities to decrease the rate at which telomeres shorten, which you can measure, by the way, I actually have an interview, a podcast interview coming up soon with the folks from Tello Years, where we talk about how you can now measure your telomere length and kind of track whether what you're doing is actually working uh, from an anti-aging protocol. Uh, but I go into how heavy strength training is is really consistently the one single form of exercise that has been shown to be the most effective form of exercise when it comes to anti-aging. And I don't need to kick that horse to death because I've talked about it a lot before. If you're not already lifting heavy stuff, you need to be. Literally um, why I started going to CrossFit. <laughs> right, exactly. But uh, I interviewed Charles, or I talk about Charles Eugster on there, who is a Britain's top sprinter. And for him, he just basically scoffs at anything low fat or fat free. So he eats a ton of like really fatty yogurts and cheeses and eggs and stuff like that. Wow. Um, Laird Hamilton's was to learn new stuff. And that, and that dude's always learning you know, new things, always challenging his prefrontal cortex. And I even get into how you need to challenge your temporal lobes, your parietal robe, lobes, and your cerebellum um, based on lessons learned from this brain expert named Dr. Daniel Amen. So check that part out. I, I uh, talk about Mark Sisson and his concept of lifting, moving, and sprinting at least some point every day. Uh, I go into Don Wildman and how once a week he'll do what he calls the hardest workout in the world, which I've done in Malibu in his basement. And it actually is a really hard workout. Uh, but if a 75 year old can do it, you can probably handle it. So check that out. And then uh, finally, that one of the one of the fit old women, uh, Olga Katelko, one of her tips is that she gives herself uh, almost every day this full body foam roller style massage, 
which actually is, speaking of my daily routines, one of the reasons that I hit my fascia every day because the fascia is so linked to your neurotransmitter production and endorphin release. And it, is, it sounds kind of stupid, but but it does add up. So go read that article. I totally didn't do it justice just now. I skimmed over it in like two minutes, but probably one of the best articles, if I don't say so myself, that I've written on anti-aging. So check that one out. Um, and now a few of the things that I wish I'd been doing for a longer period of time that I do now, or that I wish I'd done when I was younger. Now it gets um, juicy. Okay. So now it gets juicy. Uh, the first one is something I now drink every day. I take Pau Arco tree bark, which you can get off of Amazon and I'll put my, my recipe link in the show notes. It contains beta lapachines. Uh, which, uh, and, and I've spoken uh, with the person who introduced me to this tea, Dr. Mercola, um, and uh, he's explained to me how important this is for the mitochondria. Uh, it contains precursors to NAD, which is kind of like the darling new molecule of the anti-aging supplement industry. It stands for nicotinamide adenine dinucleotide. Normally pretty expensive to get this in injections or uh, supplement form, but you can get it for pennies on the dollar, by getting bark tea, and what I do is I blend the bark tea with a fat, and, and I usually use a sunflower lecithin, which contains a lot of what's called phosphatidylcholine, which makes phospholipids, which basically allows for you to absorb these beta lapachines much better, and then I add uh, organic turmeric powder to it, and I simply blend it, and that is the base for my smoothies each day. So I drink that stuff every day, Pau Diarco bark tea. That is number one. I feel amazing when I do it. You can feel it seeping into your veins, and I wish I'd been doing that for the past decade. Um, number two is over the past year and a half, I have begun a practice of both transcendental meditation and kundalini yoga. Yeah. Both of these have been shown to increase uh, cerebral blood flow. Both of them decrease salivary cortisol. Both of them... Uh, work on many of the same levels that a lot of these other anti-aging practices work on in terms of decreasing the rate at which telomeres shorten. So transcendental meditation, do I do it for twice a day for 20 minutes like my instructor told me to? Probably I not. not. <laughs> I do it about three times a week for 10 yeah. to 20 minutes. Kundalini yoga, I do some variation of that almost every day when I'm doing that sauna that I talked about or when I'm traveling and I'm in the airport and I you know need to do a body weight workout. Kundalini yoga and TM should be weapons in your toolbox for anti-aging. And you should learn both if you're serious about anti-aging. So those th that would be number two. It would be transcendental meditation and kundalini. I know that's almost two things. It's cheating, but that's it. Um, gratitude journaling. Gratefulness has been shown over and over again to result in biological and physiological responses that result in a longevity-enhancing effect. I don't need to go deep into the science. We don't have time to go deep into the science on this podcast episode. But A, if you're not already gratitude journaling, you need to be. And then B, my exact protocol does not involve lots of daily affirmations, lots of I'm so great, so wonderful, me, 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 I, 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 I'm good, I'm great, I'm wonderful, and gosh darn it, people like me. I don't do that. <laughs> so my daily journaling is this. I ask myself three questions and I respond to these three questions. A, what truth did I discover in this morning's reading? Because every morning I read a devotional and I find that if I know I'm going to need to answer a question afterwards about what I read, I'm less likely to sit there picking the eye crest out of my eyes, kind of skimming over it and not paying attention and much mm. more likely to actually absorb what I've read. Very smart. B... The next question is, what am I grateful for today? That's a pretty straightforward one, but crucial. And then C, and this is really crucial, I think, who can I pray for, help, or serve this day? Mm -hmm. Right? So every day, there is one person. This morning, it was my dad. So what did I do during breakfast this morning? I didn't like go mow my dad's lawn, right? That doesn't mean you have to do that. But I texted my dad. I said, dad, I love you. I hope you're having an amazing day. Let me know if I can help you with anything today. That's, That's it. awesome. Boom. Very cool. So, and, and you can pick a new person every day. It could be the same person for a week in a row if you really want to bug them. But uh, <laughs> gratitude journaling. And, and I will put a link in the show notes. I'm actually designing a journal that uses my exact journaling system because I, I mean, anytime I do something myself every day, I figure there's a need for it. 
So I'll put a link in the show notes where you can go. Uh, we're going to launch that journal on Kickstarter in a, in a couple of months. But if you're interested in that, that that's the third thing. So we got Pau Diarco Park Tea, Transcendental Meditation slash Kundalini, Gratitude Journaling. The next would be Genetic Testing. I wish I'd done that sooner rather than later. So I did a 23andMe genetic test. And let me just give you three examples of things that I've changed in my life that are going to help me live longer based on that test. A, I found out I have a higher than normal risk for type 2 diabetes. So I switched to a lower carbohydrate intake. I switched to saving the majority of my carbohydrates until the end of the day when I'm in a more insulin sensitive post-workout state. And I also consume lots of supplements that help with insulin sensitivity and blood sugar control. The top three being bitter melon extract, Ceylon cinnamon, and apple cider vinegar. And I would not have gone out of my way to do that unless I knew that I had this really much higher than normal risk for type 2 diabetes. I also found out that I have a higher than normal risk for prostate cancer. And so now not a day goes by when I don't go out of my way to eat a fresh handful of cherry tomatoes or a fresh mm-hmm. tomato or some other source of lycopene. Yep. And I tend to try and cook it if I can because that concentrates the lycopene even more. So, uh, I again, I wouldn't have done that had I not gotten a genetic test and found out that that's something that's going to help me live longer. Um, and then the final is that I, I uh, through DNA Fit, which is the company that I exported my 23andMe results to, I discovered that I have a lower than normal production of glutathione and superoxide dismutase, two of the most potent antioxidants that you need in your body for optimal health. So now I use glutathione or glutathione precursors like sulforaphane or broccoli sprouts. I even do, now what I do is I hack it. Once a week I do an actual glutathione injection into my right butt cheek. Um, and, and that's, by the way, speaking of the health gains company, I started doing that based on the recommendations of Dr. Gaines down at, down at the Gaines Wave Clinic. Uh, and so he, he wrote me a prescription for, for injectable glutathione. So I just inject it once a week. But I, again, not something I would have done had I not known that my own production of it was really low. So that's another thing is, is glutathione. So those are just three examples of things that I wouldn't have done had I not known about uh, these genetic uh, predispositions. So right. that's that's number that's number four. Four, very important. Now number five is uh, in, in terms of I like this one <laughs> in terms of partying, right? So so I used to think that the only way to have a good time was to drink alcohol, and alcohol from an inflammatory, from an oxidative, and from a hormonal standpoint is one of the best ways to age yourself very quickly. I your your husband actually asked me this because he was hungover. When, yeah, when, he does not do hangovers well. Yeah, so so we were at the Jackson Hole Airport. We rode to the airport together, and and he's like, Ben, when was, when was the last time you were hungover? And I couldn't remember because it has been an extremely long time since I've ever had more than two drinks of alcohol. Mm-hmm. I know, the only way I spin my dial the dials in my brain now are using plant-based medicines. So so it's either, for me, it's either uh, psilocybin or marijuana that I use. Far less damaging from an oxidative standpoint. And frankly, if I need to fall asleep at night or I need to relax, I just use CBD. Cannabidiol not only relaxes you and targets your endocannabinoid system and has a lot of the same effects that people go after when they're taking alcohol, you know, antidepressive, anti-anxiolytic, sleep enhancing, et cetera, with none of the side effects. As a matter of fact, um, what I, what I want to play for you right now, there's a really good YouTube clip. I'll link to this YouTube clip in the show notes, but but we'll we'll play it for you right here. And uh, th- this just goes into all the anti-aging, neuroprotective, uh, anti-inflammation, cellular energy enhancing properties of using something like CBD, which by the way is still legal everywhere in the world as long as you get it from hemp, not from marijuana, and something that I take every day rather than alcohol now? Well, I I think when you look at what are the pieces that will make me as healthy as I can be. So to me, adding CBD is really a beneficial piece. I mean, vitamins and minerals, we all sort of know, yes, we do that. A lot has to do with what we eat and when we eat and are we getting good probiotics. I mean, there's a lot of pieces to this. But I think CBD, because it potentially prevents so many problems, that adding that in a very small amount, you don't need a lot. You know, 
four, five, six milligrams a day can be enough as a preventative to really help. So you can get uh, topical products with this, creams, lotions, there's shampoos, conditioners, there's all kinds of applications that since you absorb it transdermally, you're gonna get small amounts through that. And we don't really get much of that in our normal diet. So when you look at, okay, it's, you know, it's neuroprotective, it's anti-inflammatory, it modulates your immune system, it protects your gut, it protects your heart muscles, it increases cell energy, it helps you recover after exercise. So for athletes, it can be a big deal because it can increase your performance and your body's capability to perform. So that's the deal with CBD. I would definitely be using it. And I use the CBD capsules. I also use a CBD vape pen. Um, uh, I'll go back and forth between both, but I do that instead of the, uh, instead of the salt rimmed margarita. Um, yeah. CBD is such an all rounder. That's what I love I about it. I swear by it. Um, yeah. Can I throw in a sixth just for the fun of it? You can right. go on. So I'm going to, I'm going to throw in a sixth and then I'm also going to, going to give you another bonus. I'm going to link you to a great article that came out at the end of 2016 on the future of anti-aging because that goes into everything from like CRISPR and editing disease out of your DNA to, uh, to like a a new brand of drinkable collagen to lab grown hearts and kidneys. Like it goes way above and beyond what I'm talking about in this episode, but go to bengreenfieldfitness.com slash 364 and check that out. Anyways, though, the last thing that I want to talk about that, that I wish I'd done, but that I really can't do is banking my stem cells. So here's why that is. So, so the idea here is that stem cells are a type of cell that have the ability to differentiate into any other type of cell in the body. So at the beginning of its life, a single cell has like this nucleus and cytoplasm and cell membrane, and then it can go on to replicate and create every other cell in your body. And that single cell has your your entire genetic code in it. It can produce everything that defines every other specialized cell in your body. So it can differentiate into skin cells, heart cells, muscle cells, kidney cells, you name it. And you have these stem cells. They they reside in your bone marrow. They're in your fat. They're in every single tissue compartment. And when you are young and you get damaged, let's say, uh, your, your kidney gets damaged or a bone gets damaged or muscle gets damaged, stem cells get mobilized to the site of damage to repair. Uh, and this mm-hmm. capability slows dramatically as you age. As you age. As you, yeah. as you age, you, you simply you lose much of the ability for your stem cells to be able to do that. Now, the idea here is that when you are born, you're at a point near biological perfection. Meaning if you're born and you're able to somehow gather up and capture all those stem cells when you're born with all their original uncorrupted DNA and then have those around for potential use in the future, that's a really, really smart anti-aging protocol. And we now live in an era where you can bank your kids' stem cells. You can bank a baby's stem cells. Uh, And there, there, there are a variety of companies that will do this now. But I, I, uh, I wish I'd done this with my kids. I'm, I'm going to bank their, their teeth stem cells. I'm very interested still in banking my own stem cells. But And comment in the show notes, by the way, if, if you have any ideas for me as far as a company that can do this, because I've approached the Human Longevity Institute, but I haven't heard back from them. Um, but there's a whole bunch of companies that if your children or your grandchildren um, are you know, relatively young and you want to bank their stem cells, this, this works more for when they're born. There are a number of different companies that do this. One of them is called Life Bank USA. It's about two to five grand to actually get the stem cells. But I actually really wish that when I was much, much younger, I'd have banked my stem cells and I still want to bank my stem cells. I just, um, I haven't yet found a good source to do it. So I'm still looking. And and again, like if if you're ahead of the curve of me on this and you have, you have a resource for me or anybody else listening in to bank your stem cells, um, then let us know in the show notes over at bengreenfieldfitness.com slash 364. But, but, uh, if you are planning on having a, a child soon, um, or you have a relatively young child, check out Life Bank USA, and they can actually bank 
uh, your children or your grandchildren's uh, stem cells. And I'll definitely make sure, you know, I'll pay for my grandchildren to have it done when River and Taryn have their kids. Um, and I'll, I'll probably bank River and Taryn's teeth uh, or, or bone marrow stem cells pretty soon because we've been talking about it recently during our, our dinner talks. Uh, but that's the last thing is stem cell mm. banking. So I'll, I'll put links to uh, to that in the show notes as well if that's something that, that you're interested in doing. So those are the biggies. Those are the biggies when it comes to anti-aging. Tyson, you're the most forward-thinking 21-year-old I've ever met, and you're an Aussie, so I like you. But there you go. That's how you can live to 120. With beautiful baby-like skin. So there you have it. All right. Um, Well, shall we give something away before we end this show? We definitely should give something away. Okay. It's my favorite part. If you want to win something and you want to spread good karma and support this show, you can go and leave an iTunes review. And you can do that uh, over on, of all places, iTunes. Just do a search for the Ben (laughs) Greedville Fitness Show or we'll link to it in the show notes. Uh, but if you hear your review read, then that means that you qualified to win a gear pack. You didn't qualify. You won a gear pack. Uh, and all you need to do is email your t-shirt size to gear at greenfieldfitnesssystems.com. That's gear at greenfieldfitnesssystems.com. And we will send you a cool beanie, a BPA-free water bottle, and a killer tech t-shirt that you can take with you to the gym to show off your guns or whatever else you want to show off when you're at the mm-hmm. gym. So uh, we got a, a review. It says, Education for Life. Five-star review by Droid Kids. Kind of a long review, but do you want to take this one away, Rachel? Yes. And re- read it in, in your most exciting rock star voice. Oh, the accent voice? All right. I considered myself a well-informed, educated, relatively healthy individual. When I listened to a handful of these podcasts, I realized I was a complete neophyte. I've now been anointed. I have conversations with licensed dietitians and personal trainers that have never heard of half the current health trends that Ben is routinely covering and presenting to listeners through a series of fascinating articles, guests, and best of all, personal experience. Contrary to what many of the haters say, Ben isn't solely peddling products for personal gain on his show. He has sponsors, some really good sponsors actually, and some that I care not to patronize. You do not have to listen to the first five minutes of the show if you don't want to hear about the items that Ben uses to make a living and proliferate his cause of promoting functional, sustainable, and truly exceptional life choices. Anybody that feels they're being sold to just by listening to his sponsors should never turn on a TV or walk into a store. You can decide for yourself what to implement in your own routine to improve your future self. Great show. Nice guy. This will make you smarter and better. Just listen. I like how he's preaching about how you shouldn't skip the commercials. <laughs> I like that he has our back. Thanks, Actually, man. I like I like the guy. I learn yeah. a, I, I learn a ton from my own commercials because random people, you know, like shocking your. Who would have known about that unless they decided <laughs> to advertise on the show? Um, right. So yeah, this stuff where and and watches that actually look good. I mean, I'm just saying, like some of the stuff is actually pretty interesting. Like even the commercials. So if I don't say so myself. Um, anyways, though, that all being said, Rachel, thanks for coming on the show today and sharing ben, all this for stuff me. with me. And, uh, if you have questions, comments, feedback, et cetera, just go to bengreenfieldfitness.com slash 364, where you can access the show notes for today's show. Everything from Dr. Ho's decompression belt to the how to look good naked article to my book on my daily routines to banking your own stem cells and much more. Check it all out. BenGreenfieldFitness.com slash 364. Over and out. You've been listening to the Ben Greenfield Fitness Podcast. Go to BenGreenfieldFitness.com for even more cutting-edge fitness and performance advice. 